So, welcome back everyone. Um, last Thursday I did not stream because it was Thanksgiving. I have some really exciting news. I opened a P.O. box. I'll make a video for that very soon. Uh, so there's a Portrait Studio sale and it's 20% off. And it's going to last only until Friday. There is another sale in December which lasts also a week. It's going to be on Christmas week. It's going to be a similar sale to this for anyone who wants it. But I just uploaded a video um, uh, announcing this. And I'll upload a video announcing the Mac release. We still haven't gotten any news back from Apple. Um, but they'll be contacting us very soon, confirming our store, and finally um, having the product available for Mac users. We've gone through so many hoops, so many loops, so many hoops on fire to get into uh, the Mac store, and hopefully this no, there's no more after this. They're just going to approve of it, no more issues, and we can just send out, send out the, the store link to everyone. And uh, I think that's it for now. I'll be going on Christmas vacation starting the 20th. Uh, so that's when our last class, or uh, probably our last class will be the 18th. Um, if you guys want to, so this is going to be kind of like an unofficial announcement. I'll post it on the wall very, very soon. But um, and we can always do the critique hour for it at a later time. Uh, but I want to see you guys design a Christmas town. So I want to re-announce re, um, the Christmas town challenge. Um, there is also another challenge, which is a Christmas elf designing a character design for your Christmas elf. So it can be a, a very um, uh, task-driven character design. So what's the task of the elf and what do they do? And you're supposed to reflect that in their character design. It can be a completely full illustration of, a, of an elf, it can be just sketch lines, um, but I'd love to see you guys drafting some of these things, like you're painting the occupants of the Christmas town, or the Christmas town itself. Full illustration, so I'll upload information for that very soon after class. And so yeah, the announcements are the P.O. Box is now open, Portrait Studio is on sale for anyone who wants to own it, and uh, the, uh, the challenge, the Christmas uh, design challenge, which can be either an elf design, or a holiday town. Um, and if you guys want to know how uh, last year's went um, and the curriculum and, and all of that stuff that went into um, the criteria, sorry, for that uh, challenge, you can just go into the uh, video and search up Christmas holiday challenge um, or Christmas town or holiday town and you'll be able to find the video. Um, and that's it. Let's get started on the critique hour today. Okie dokie, any questions at all? <clears throat> Last year I had some great submissions. Yeah, it really did. I, I just love seeing those little sparkling, warm interior lights of the town with the cold out, outer light environment. I can't wait to see some of that. Um, uh, and uh, she has Instagram. Yeah, I do have Instagram. Post it on Instagram too. Oh yeah, I'll post it everywhere, the P.O. Box, just so, um, and if, you, if, if I end up having like 500 <laughs> or something, I won't be able to open them all on the video. I mean, I'd love to, like, I'd love to accumulate 500 postcards, um, and actually like, you know, just have them right there tangibly in front of me, that'd be amazing, but I don't expect 500 of them, but I'll try my best to, to have a return, like, thank you note or something like that to everyone who sends something. It'd be really cool to finally communicate with each other physically. You know, the postage system is just so, is so, is so something that we don't really experience. And just having it there on Christmas and going to the post office on Christmas is just something so novelty about that. I really look forward to it. Um, and I've had such a rough year. I've had such a horrible, horrible year. I'm so looking forward to just Christmas time and Christmas holiday and just seeing an end to this horrid year. It started off with a strike and some creep following me around in the gym and all this horrible stuff and so many injuries and back problems and so many weird things that yes they've strengthened me but they've put me through a lot and I just want to say goodbye to this year and hope for the best next year. I'm so tired of being tested. I just want to keep my mind right for you guys and keep running these sessions. Okay, all that out of the way, let's get started. Um, so. What I want to talk about today is an extension of the last lesson I gave, which is bodies of water reveal light environment. Um, and I've chosen some of the submissions for the previous challenges, uh, just so we can talk about them at least. I know I never got to them, I'm so sorry, as, as a dedicated critique hour. So what is the light environment here apart from the light rays coming in? 
which you've overdone, I think. You've just used one, two, three, four, five, six lines to represent light coming in. Instead of actually having things react to the light, you've actually drawn the light. That's the biggest mistake here. Don't draw the light. Don't point to where the light, this is the light. Don't do that. That's a mistake. The reason that's a mistake is because you're not really reacting to anything with form. You're not describing form. You're just, again, being line dependent. You've actually drawn the lines of the light. Instead of having a body of light reflecting, creating, and casting shadows on a body of water that reveals the light environment, you've just drawn a bunch of lines and it's just created a messy, just fanning of, of, of lines with some cool, interesting color saturation effects and that's it. The character itself has less detail on them then this over contrasted thing and you might say oh no the character has more detail the character has a lot of detail on them no they don't they don't have any decent edge work they don't have any contrast and they have fake detail which is you shrinking your brush all the way down expecting it to um uh just do all the work and render the image for you this has more detail in that it has edges it has some saturation nearby which is a big giveaway for focal point and it has contrast. It has a lot of light against dark. So this is the biggest mistake. This is how you screwed yourself over for everything else in the painting. You were hoping that throwing in some lens flares was going to give the image some quality. It doesn't. In fact, if you had gotten rid of this, you would have seen much more happen in your painting. So let's start with that. So the rule is, what is the rule about light environments and bodies of water? Anyone uh, want to repeat that back to me? And yes, please post your notes in the community. I am giving out free brushes. And by the way, if you've won brushes at any point in time in after hours or something and you haven't received your reward yet, please message me on Facebook to remind me. I had a horrible two months and I've just completely forgotten about everything. If you have not gotten your rewards and you are waiting for them politely, please message me. Um, also, my messages on Facebook have been completely deleted and restarted, so I don't have any old um, correspondences with any students or something like that in my Facebook group. I don't know why that happened, but um, I need you guys to message me back. I don't know where to find the history. I check mark everything I read and it archives it, but I can't seem to find them so that I can track down people who haven't been given their rewards. Um, so yes, bodies of water reveal the light environment, so let's darken. The environment. Why am I darkening the environment? Because it's not a universal light source. It's a weak light source. Look at how much black you have. That's because it's a closed off bathroom. And instantly when we did this, the room, just the cavernous kind of darkness in the room has really, really came through. And there is a bit of a gradient working here. All right, so I'm gonna to try to transform this piece as much as time allows. Then you have this glowing character, um, which should first be reflected on the water below. They are an opaque character, unless they have, they are a light source, they are opaque. The light environment wins, and so we do have some brightness behind the character in that there is some minor reflection of the nearby light in the water reflecting back up against and into the light and maybe into his face revealing him. So we have some reflection there. We have a cast shadow because water is still matter. We can have cast shadows on water. Usually the water is so reflective it diffuses the cast shadows out but in this case the water is just steamy enough and just dark enough in the room that we can cover up a lot of the light behind the character or the space of the water behind the character. Okay, so we have reflection has been considered and the, and the water, um, the, the cast shadow has been considered. Then the character needs to be darker. Your character here has this glowing effect on them and I just need to find a really good way to separate them. So how have I organized this? If anyone can put it in like a, a list of tasks, how did I go about organizing this paint over? What's the first and most important thing to consider in an illustration? 
It's not a trick question. It's always the same answer. You can bet on it until the end of time. What is the one thing you can always trust is the most important thing to do in an illustration? All right, so I've darkened the character. He's responding to his light environment. He does have some light to him. I'm getting rid of that glow because this character is the point of the painting. They're healing. They've got some blood on them. Something happened and you're telling that their story. But you don't seem to be treating them like they're the most important part of the painting. They don't have any edge work on them. They just have, they're just secondary to all this brightness. And then you have the parts of the light that parts of the object that do look up at the light. So where that ray of light does come in. So the top part of their shoulder. And just think like cube. No longer see a person here. Think cubes, whatever the light can get is what will be illuminated. And this person has is inside water, so that means that they are going to be a bit reflective. So I'm just testing it out with the uh, navigator here. I'm going to use soft brush instead. Okay, so these are the areas that are responding to the light source. And then you've got some minor light coming in from, oopsie, from here, bouncing on the character's arm. If this is a girl character, it's very difficult to read their gender right now. You haven't really posed them in such a way where their gender is easy to see. A little bit of bounce light behind them. Remember, it's not about being perfect right now. It's about building a form study environment. So now I'm blending. Oopsie. Getting my scatter brush. And blending goes all the way down. Just thinking about their arm, thinking about the terminator line, the cast shadow of the head. Maybe the neck will get a little bit of light. Okay. All right. So first and most important thing is the individual hairs on the head. Band. <laughs> Detail and color are to be applied after the illustration is fundamentally sound. Good. Um, three most important thing in illustration is the form and the light environment. Fixed light environment. Excellent. That means, what's the number one most important part of the light environment? The light environment is three-parter. What are the three parts of the light environment? Okay. It's a three-parter. It's a, it's a it's a trifecta or whatever silly anime word right so I'm reflecting some light all around the hair creating shadows creating edges so the arm is in front of that little pocket of shadow there thinking about the character as the most important part and then with burn tool somehow, some way, I'm going to try to bring in the right amount of contrast on the character. I blend out their face. I don't want to put a little shadow for the eye socket and no eyebrows. You're just painting a skeleton at this point. All right, so this is what I'm doing right now for the sake of the read, just for the arm, since it's the most prominent and anatomical component. Just working on the arm and the muscles here. Some of that bounce light. <clears throat> and then the edge of the rest of the body against the background. The background should be a bit darker. It's a dark room and the light seems to be focused only on the character. So all of this out. I should have used a larger brush. Should be a little bit darker. All right, so I'm gonna try to find a way to get rid of all of that. Those those light rays here, because you don't need all that much. It's gonna be tricky. I have to stay zoomed out. All right, here goes nothing. See, it's really difficult to pull this off because there's no info underneath the black value. And there goes my back. 
Alright, so what I'm doing is throwing in an imperfect spotlight. An imperfect spotlight is very nice because it doesn't reveal everything we want to see. It leaves a little mystery and helps write the story. I can't go back and fix all the stained glass excessive misprioritized detail you have in the background there, but I'm gonna... Is that a word? Misprioritized? Does not sound like a word. And I'm going to try to make it one beam of light, one body of light that is only visible when the steam really rides up. So we're not actually pointing to a body of, of, of light coming out of the window. We have no business with the edge of the canvas. There's no business there. It's just all steam hanging around the surface of the water, revealing some of the light. And the character should be the most important aspect of this painting. Not just that, what's happening to the character, all that blood. So you should look up what blood looks like in water and uh, try to create that pattern because it's going to be a, like a, an explosion of saturation and a bunch of blue and blue and green, I mean uh, red and green, sorry did I say blue? A bunch of red and, and, and green, I mean in blue green. <laughs> So red and green that don't they don't get along and what you're gonna have is it's really nice complementary saturation just telling the story. So sometimes steam just kind of floats on the surface and creates a path along with the ripples. So I'm just trying to create that effect right now. This is what you're painting. It's not, you know, it's not mo the most ideal painting I've ever, like my most ideal um, initial read of a paint over. But the point is that this is what your painting should have looked like starting out. <clears throat> Ugh, I'm just waiting for Photoshop to get its shit together. And then I'm going to use the steam brush, which is my just my cloud brush on this and look at how that steam is just climbing up catching the light you don't paint the light you paint what the light touches and in that you reveal the light write that back to me that's it that's that's all it is you see how i'm using this brush to create the negative space that the steam is revealing in the light's direction okay so that's what your painting should have looked like early on. And then you've got that really dim, almost gray red moving into pure red once the light touches it. And that's the blood. So you've got their little injury. Actually, that's not purple enough, honestly. It's a dark scene. There should not be any orange in the blood color. And I'll adjust it as I go. And that color kind of does a little red shift into the water. Blood does this really funny webbing thing once it reaches the water. And I'm just giving myself too much and then using the negative space on my brush to kind of create those little webbing paths of blood as it mixes in with the water. So it moved from purple to warm, as you can see, and it shouldn't be too visible because there's steam in the way, but it's just enough red that we know something happened. And it's, it's a lot of blood, so the start of it shouldn't be chalky or, or a light amount of blood. It should be a deep cut. And honestly, I don't know if they'd still be bleeding. They must have just jumped in the way. They must have been cut, shanked, and then jumped straight in the, <laughs> in the bath. Okay, so I'm just shifting that away from purple just a little bit. And then darkening that into the mid-tones. Okay, so you see I'm not bringing in all my contrast just yet. Let me read the comments. Um, light is demonstrated by what it reveals. Exactly. You paint what the light touches, and in that you reveal the light. 
You don't paint the light itself. You paint what it touches to reveal the light. Everything the light touches, Simba, will be revealed. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. It's okay, Kaya. Um, okay, beautiful. So let's go back to what is extremely shiny. What is, what is catching a lot of the light? What has a lot of reflection on it? So there's the, um, the water on the body, the water in the hair. And it's just little pieces. I really can't do the hair with a soft brush, but bear with me. It's just whatever is shining, catching some light right along the rim of the hair. Okay, and then there's that glow back of the water reflecting some stuff. And there's that really strong receiving of the light on the surface of the, of the water. But essentially the water is dark because it reflects the light environment. The light environment is a dark closed off room. I'm going to throw just a little bit of like a glow out there in the edge where the water reach, uh, reflects back into the wall. That would be the pattern. I forget what that's called. That's Fresno or Fresno or whatever. And just some of this smoke is catching the light. Not comfortable with all this uh, contrast though, so I'm just going to go back and erase what I don't want. Just right before Dodge Tool happened. Okay. Darker towards the side, obviously. Not the same kind of reflection. And if you do have the stained glass effect or this tiling thing going on. I recommend some tiles. I don't recommend stained glass because there's not even enough light to reveal them. But if you did have windows, it would be a really, really bright window. It would be reflecting what's happening outside. So the window would look something like that. And that's pretty much how light I'd keep the window. But if it's a private little bathhouse, I don't think it's good for your composition since you can decide what you want there. I don't recommend any windows. Um, doesn't make much sense to have them there. A wall of really comfortable, compact um, looking tiles might be a better design option. And then you have surface detail like the water detail. I'll try to pull that off like this. And then all you have left after this is the portrait. Okay, so this is all just the environment, just the accessory stuff that's supposed to be under rendered. You shouldn't be, you know, um, ignoring the portrait or having very minor detail on it. Because we have all that bounce light right now on the rest of the body from the surface of the water, you should have enough space to do your or enough light to reveal some of the portrait of this character in distress. So um, let's talk about these edges some more. There should be more clean edges separating the character from the background. It's a very specific ray of light coming down. Just clean up and thinking about this imperfect spotlight. And all that reveals it is just the, the smoke. And then we're casting shadows on the character as well. How big is this canvas? Okay, so for the character, there's just enough bounce light to reveal more detail on their body. So I would say we would get another core shadow here on their arm and a terminator running along the side. Careful with that bounce light, don't make, don't make it too bright. We have more of a strong ray of light on the side of the cylinder facing the, the primary, which is the spotlight. Okay, we have no room for detail for like the breasts or anything like that, but you may be able to reveal the breasts with some bounce light. Just like that, if you're prioritizing that. And then, let's 
So the bounce light right now is your primary in relation to the character. The light environment is king, and in this case it's a dark room. You have a lot of bounce light here. This, this kid is just going everywhere. So. I recommend um, some like curly wet hair. Just kind of dragging below the character towards the ground. Hair tends to look darker when it's wet. Again, more edge work against the background. That's all you have to create a read. Your objects against, against the background and the object being darker or lighter than the background, depending on which, which way you're looking. So right now the hair is darker than the water behind, but the object is sort of lighter than the environment behind because he's right under the spotlight. Or she. Okay, so I'm just adding more of these little curls. Raising their level just a bit higher because there's always that steam. Diffusing everything it's in front of, blurring away. And seeing what I can do to reveal more details. So, the top of the back, shoulder blades, very top of the. Uh, area directly like the cervical area of the back right here in fact I'm just gonna open portrait studio so I can double check how that's gonna look and so I may not get to character designs for the creepy creature challenge I'm so sorry just want to make it a thorough paint over a little bit of light on the top of the neck, right towards the top. So I'm just guessing most of these, but I'll be checking Fortune Studio in a second. And you can build this entire scene in Portrait Studio if that's what it takes. You can even have smoke added in <laughs> to your environment and choose this exact light environment. So let me see if I can create it for us. waiting for it to load and then in just some moments I'm gonna get the sponge tool and throw in little spots of saturation oopsie wrong thing spots of saturation for the blood I actually need to make that blood uh, flow with the ripples of the water because it's just more water I'm just using liquefied. Okay. Great. And just smudging really nicely wherever we have that ripple. And then now I'm building the face, the edge, little pocket of the neck and the shoulders. I'm just rotating the canvas so we can get a better idea of where the face is. And with the bounce light, I'm painting the face, so the forehead, the nose bridge. It's okay if the arm is in the way, I can always address those later, but I'm just blocking at this point. The cheek space, the upper eyelid, closing, and then address all that after. The eyebrow, space underneath. The eyebrow shadow, core shadows, areas where the face kind of closes off, the ear, just blocking my way, no mistakes really possible at this point because I know where my light source is, and if you've done this study before, light coming in from the front on, this, on a side view, then you've prepared yourself for what's required. And now we blend. We blend along fat pockets, blend along um, smoother transitions. The eyes are closed. I'll address that in a second. 
the lips kind of look like they're smiling. If they're smiling, then that's cool to add that to the story. Maybe they're relieved they finally have some rest. Okay, the shape of the head is a little funny. And then smudge in some more. Okay, so what I'm going to do is delete this model and load in the uh, mannequin. And I'm going to just rotate the mannequin. To, I mean, I don't have to really do that, but I'm just going to rotate the mannequin. Bend her forward. Bend her arms forward. And let me just rotate her back. Now you've got on-screen rotators, so you don't have to... I mean, you can just rotate the whole scene now. Um, but I'd rather rotate her like where she is. And rotate the neck. Oops. And then the head. And then I'm just going to close that. Hide joints. And then using one, I'm going to just adjust the light like it's coming in from the same way it is on the character. And then I'm going to delete this space under. And darken the background color. I'm going to leave her bright because she is sort of getting that light. And then I'm going to add a, maybe I should have added the reflector. Yeah, I'm going to add another model. Uh, basic um, animal skulls, busts, hands. Oh, secondary model. Where is that? Um, add model. Uh, basic. I guess let's just use that. Oops. Just shrink it. And expand it like a water body, like a body of water. Move it this way. Okay, so I'm just going to zoom in and adjust the model. I'm going to turn on enhanced lighting, which is going to give me just want a really basic bounce light. Instead of that, actually, I'm just going to put in a secondary lighting, a point light indicator off. I'm going to throw it right there where the water is. And the arm is really what's casting the shadow, so... I'm going to show... Actually, I'm going to just um, decrease the strength and the range. I still want that primary light to cast a shadow. Son of a cast a shadow behind the character. So that's where the shadow should go. So bear with me. Um, I'm going to show joints again, just so I can... How is the arm posed? Okay, so it's kind of down. And up. Rotated. Wrist is bent forward, and this is rotated even more. And the other joint, I hope I'm choosing. Oops. No, nope, go back up. Um, where are you? This one. Okay, rotating it back. And this fella gets moved back over here. So what I want to do um, is just uh, 
turn off ambient light. I forget how to do that because I'm not a pro at this. Like, I will. Ambient reflectivity. Just up a little bit. And then the fog. Oh, the fog has already been considered. So the head is actually rotated toward us. So the temple is actually going to be a cutoff point. So high joints, the temple. I haven't really brought in the knees, so you can just forget the knees. Just imagine the knees are there. The The light on the elbow looks great. The knees, I mean the arm is, is actually accurate. I think the body is even more bent forward. So what we're missing mostly is just the top of the ear catching some light. Because that's a really big one. The ear kind of sticks out, so that's a block there. And the ear does catch light, so that looks right. The ear placement is a little bit off, though. And then this area here does cast the shadow a little bit longer. This gets a lot of light just by looking at it. I'm going to adjust it one more time. Just adjust the model one more time. So, secondary models. I'm just going to hide this while I adjust the body. Um, show joints. The whole body is doing this. And that is doing that. And They're really tucking their head in. I'm just going to shrink the head. Okay. So the light stops right about there. So it does extend a bit far. And our contrast is really, really delicate right now. We're not really trying to push it far just yet because contrast is something that you dress up all your good edges with. It's not something that you depend on all the way early on. Contrast, if it's required, we add it. That looks right. That little shadow stretching from the arm out. Yeah, that shadow right there. Okay, so now I'm going to just bring in the contrast that I need right towards the end of anything that is catching the light. And that contrast is going to travel along the arm right over here. Just there. A little bit on the forehead. And I'm just going to keep blending away at the face. If their eyes are closed, I can now put that detail in. And start detailing. Eye from side view looks more like a triangle. Just following that, the top of the lip should have some light. Bottom of the nose, cut off. Okay. And then the temple is where all the shadows start, all the highlights stop, so that travels all the way down. Okay, so I'm, I'm a bit on the fence about the color of the blood. I do want to desaturate it, but there's always those illustrations that saturate blood, and it's, it's a little bit cheesy, but in it being cheesy, it looks good for some reason. So I'm just desaturating the blood just so it matches its light environment towards the shadowed part of the body. And then finally, from a distance, I'm going to just reflect light back up to kind of add that last little cinematic touch of light reflecting. Ugh, my Photoshop's like crashing. Reflecting back up towards the light. And then blending this radial edge out. 
finding anywhere on the face where I can sneak in some quick contrast. And I do want to bring in that subsurface scattering blue that I just saw here. Yeah, I feel like this forehead is just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But this all started by having an accurate representation of the what. What did we do first again? And then just a larger brush for what the hair is doing. Maybe some more hair along the sides getting caught under the hand. Breaking the silhouette. Okay, I'm gonna bring down the levels a little bit. They're a bit too washed out along the top side. And if you can, find a way to bring in some more bounce light, maybe another little, like, some kind of reflection. Okay, so I'm going to have to adjust this images layer. Image, image, oh god, 6,000? <laughs> Why? <laughs> god, the size is unbelievable. I don't even use 6,000 on anything I've ever painted. And I'm just going to start smudging. I want to reinforce that steam. And apart from the steam, you really don't have anywhere to include any kind of texture. Okay. And then just adjusting some dodge tool madness and uh, looking more at the actual caves and cavities in the face and the body so right over here there's a cavity right there just finding anywhere where light just does not act access and this feels awkward like a line okay and then the wall behind should be even darker, the wall. This whole wall out here should be darker going up. I'm going to try to pull this off with uh, <clears throat> burn. And then I'll be done with this excruciating lesson. <laughs> No, it's a lot went into it, but it's one of those more complicated scenes that I like to take on for a critique hour because they um, they really do offer you a, a lot of insight on what goes on in an illustration in this full scale and how to organize it. All right, so this edge is really important and the steam really getting caught up here. It can also be caught up here somewhere. But wherever the steam faces at the light, that's where we would um, not erase. But we erase any part of the steam that doesn't reveal the light. So it's like a cloud. So I'm erasing at the side of the body of the steam. It really wouldn't be visible without the light. So that's why we're kind of just... But you can really do any pattern. It's still going to read as steam. But I like to keep it realistic. And then out here, I would probably smudge to avoid any excessive edges on the edge of the canvas. And then I'm really tempted to dodge tool like this and dodge tool like that, just towards the top of her head. Um, and then the, whatever detail is needed everywhere else, but mm, it's a bit too much contrast. Any questions? Is smudge tool a good tool? The smudge tool is the best tool in the world. Um, the smudge tool is the king of tools because it lets you create a more realistic um, habit of blending your values that you can transfer back into your sketches. It's not a digitally dependent tool. Smudge tool on a scatter brush is exactly what you need to do. Um, 
uh, and uh, uh, when you are attaching scatter, you're creating that same distribution of values that you're smudging between each other, which is what happens in real life on a sketchbook. Uh, you don't have eyedropper tool in the real world. Smudge tool is the best tool. Smoke is, is, is different because smoke is um, like a combustion, so it can be black. So no, smoke doesn't really reflect light the way steam does. Um, it's just not the same. I mean, if it was a dark scene and there was smoke in the room, it would catch the light and it would reveal light rays because the smoke is, is just revealing where the light... You know how when you have a dusty house and you open your curtain and you can see the light of the sunlight moving in. That's not sunlight you're seeing and that light is a material you can touch. That's the dust catching the light in wherever the light is shining in. Uh, same thing with God rays and, and humidity levels. So smoke, if it's in daytime, would be black. Steam in daytime is invisible. That's what I want you to remember. Um, buy her smudge brushes. Oh, thank you so much, Kyle. I always have a laggy feeling when I'm using smudge tool. Your, your computer might be a bit weak. Smudge tool is a really big deal for your RAM and uh, your GPU performance. You really do need a good computer to run smudge tool on a large canvas. Um, but yeah, I hope this painting helped you. It does have some last little issues with it. Like I would just keep working on it, trying to find some balance between reflection and uh, more components in the painting. We've pretty much just removed everything, uh, but I hope it has illuminated some workflow issues you've had, some issues with your workflow. So image, image size, 3000. Okay, so for the light ray to make sense, it would have to be a little bit more like this, a dark room. If it was light coming through the stained glass, many windows opened, then it would make sense why it's so daytime. If the entire roof of the area was open, it would explain why we're seeing so much of the character, why we're seeing their reflection in the water. But it, these single rays weren't doing much. You're, you weren't responding to a body of light. You had all this black here, which didn't make any sense if the room was this bright, bright enough to reveal the character. Why is this, unless there's a shadow looming over him or a monster, one daytime, in the bathroom, in daytime, there is an actual shadow, smoky shadow, coming up to eat him up, then it wouldn't really make any sense. I'm re reacting to this light environment you've chosen. The excessive lines you're using, I got rid of those and I left them with a nice little ray of light. Again, you can always raise up the contrast if you need it, but if this is just a single little light environment illustration. As for your... Your your cropped your cropping it's it's a very you should call it a day with this kind of this kind of crop you really should not be cropping like this and if you are you should be having a long or short illustration um, I mean long or horizontal illustration no short weird little tile and if you really want to make him feel alone or something like that you should shrink him in the canvas a little bit more. Where he was in the canvas wasn't really making much sense. If you want a lot of dramatic contrast, you can, you know, just go for something like, let me use the midtone instead, something like this for more dramatic reactions and the light, more bounce light, just more light all around. But in the dark room nonetheless, if that's what you're going for, something a little bit more foggy and steamy. Okay. Um, do you think it was meant to have a holy atmosphere or a gloomy atmosphere? The painting felt like it couldn't decide. Um, I agree. I think it meant for something gloomy. I look at the character, not the background, to tell what's being told, to tell, find the story. The artist may think they're telling another story, but they're not. The story you tell is the story in the character. The character's resting, long battle, bleeding, maybe they're a loner, maybe they've snuck into a bathhouse, maybe they've snuck into a... And a sewage kind of or, or abandoned place or he's just taking a bath. I don't know. He seems like a, someone who has been invited to a bathhouse to rest. It seems like a rich area, not really abandoned, but maybe abandoned. Nevertheless, it is, I just had a crazy deja vu. Um, um, it is a bathhouse and a character is alone bleeding. So I think it's supposed to be a gloomy environment and 
Again, you guys are so concerned with making the character lighter than everything. You forget sometimes the character is darker than the environment. Even if they're under a spotlight, the spotlight isn't strong enough to illuminate the whole room. And in the light environment, if the light is weak, everything else is invisible. You only have the moments of highlight visible. It's a good place to start with your continuation of this painting, or you can just call it a day with what you've learned here and move on. Um, any more questions at all? Just at Istabrak when you're asking the question. When starting an illustration with the moon, you tackle the environment first and then work from that. When starting an illustration with a portrait involved, yes, absolutely. You tackle the light environment. Where is the? Where are they sitting? What is the room? What is the uh, that time of day? What's the character wearing? How much reflection will be able to work with? Where's the bounce light? What's going to be revealing them? All of those decisions should be made ahead of time. I don't know how anybody starts a painting without knowing what time of day it is in the painting. How can you start a painting without having a light source in there and all its characteristics considered? Um, it's weird, but can you just smudge a black patch with a gray patch? I don't know why, but Photoshop puts like a white circle inside the black when I smudge from black to white. It might be something to do with like alpha or I forget, gamma. I forget what that is, but it's to do with how your colors are visible in your monitor. It might be a monitor problem that you have or it just might be photoshop um oh you also if you get a colors that's because in my brush set i put in uh, a little bit of noise added that's because i'm always smudging anyway and i can always grayscale when i'm painting but i'm always smudging a, a colored picture um and if it's grayscale i just grayscale as i go but i like the noise the color noise that's added <clears throat> um thank you Hassan. Um, mood reminds me of Jamie and Brienne in Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. And, uh, any more questions at all? <laughs> Block him away, downtown. <laughs> uh, let's move on. I'm gonna try to sneak in one more, uh, painting to do with the light environment. I'm gonna try to do both. Your background color right now for the sky is so dark. And this is supposed to be a sandy scene, a sandy kind of like desert scene, and the character has just emerged from the ground midday to this colossus to eat its victims. So what you did essentially is that you gave us a nighttime blue scene, but enough light that we can see the yellow in the sand. You don't see the yellow in the sand. Sand turns purple at night. It's just it's so bright it takes the color, excuse me, of, of whatever... It's the dominant light environment color. So that would be the blue of the nighttime. So it kind of looks purpley, pinkish, pinkish mostly and yellowish at sunset. But when there is enough light to reveal the yellow of the sand dunes and the uh, pyramids, so I can't tell if they're just sand blocks or pyramids right now, we will have enough color in the sky to reveal all this. So you actually had um, nighttime blue. And then again, I'm just going to raise these clouds up to make them make sense. Okay, uh, still looking a little bit off. Then we have, so you have no light environment conversation here between all your colors. None of your colors are sharing an environment. You need some more yellow in the formula of the color you chose for the pyramid because essentially it's sand and compressed sand and mud and stuff. And what will happen is it'll be pretty reflective. And so I'm just moving this into white and sliding into yellow and that'll be a color I apply with some degree of opacity. Okay, I'm going to sneak in a little bit of the blue and the cast shadows in a second and use some white over here just to show it off that it's all coming from the same sky. See how they're fitting in? And then now in the shadow color I'm going to bring in some of the blue of the sky just to cool it down. I'm also going to desaturate it. Including the Hands of the Beast. Ooh, sounds like a good uh, book cover uh, title. 
like for a mock title or even just an actual title. The Hands of the Beast by Lantaris Valdemar. <laughs> and um, I'm darkening, desaturating, and shifting into the cools. Maybe not darkening because it's not that. All right, let me just see where the fuck I'm sitting right now. Sorry, sorry, I swore. I'm trying not to swear. And um, just throwing in some of that environment blue right on the side of the dune. Okay, then you've got the far objects. The far objects have almost no atmospheric fade, no atmospheric perspective applied. Everything just seems like it's, I mean, you have a little bit of lightness, but it's just not enough. You're depending way too much on like airborne particles to pull off your uh, your lower half of your canvas. All right, we don't see the bottom, so don't be scared of overdoing. We're seeing only the top of the pyramid. So yeah, typically we're not even capable of seeing the bottom of it. So that's okay. I, I don't recommend the successive cloud business because it's just awkwardly framing the canvas. Just a simple blue, you know, would really do a lot for your painting. It opens up the sky, makes him feel like humongous, and uh, makes him feel creepy. So he's a, a dune kind of dune worm in the desert, and he's just surfaced. He's really close up to the edge of the canvas too, really bad framing here. So I might like uh, cancel. Open up some. And I might um, just extend the canvas above and maybe move him over here. This is where ideally I would want him to be, but again, there's so much I can do. Only so much I can do. And then you have no light color unified between him and the dune. Again, it feels like everything's coming out of a different light environment. So I'm going to just pretend the light is coming from this. I mean, it is coming from the side. Look at the pyramid. What am I saying? And the uh, side of his head. I'm going to have to desaturate. Why do we desaturate after we use dodge tool? Anybody? The side of his arms. He's got scales and stuff. His far arm should get some of that. This is a really bad dodge tool job. I hope you do a better job than I am. All right, so he's really exposed, desert sun, bright, scorching desert. The guy just resurfaced to, to hunt or to torment people. If he's mystical, a creature, I would probably give him some desaturation, but it looks like a magic card, kind of like a creature in its own right. Try not to get that icky dodge tool bleed. So gross in effect, so disgusting. Okay, I'm just uh, I'm tracking down any of these scales here. It's catching some light. So I don't know how many videos so far have I done about the importance of a light environment and light environment problems are probably the most that's plaguing artists today. I mean, yeah, it's good to learn some symmetry and rush that a little bit, but it's really not that when you're ready to do illustrations, your biggest issue will be tackling how to make your character fit in their environment, not look like a bunch of toys placed beside each other on a tabletop. That's when, that's when things look really newbie, when you have a character that is really well drawn in a really, really crappy environment. Just throwing in that environment balance light. And then this far arm right here needs some light on it. Okay, maybe some bounce light on the neck. I'm trying my best here. And then desaturation wherever dodge tool shat on everything. And then might mess around with saturation on wherever the light touched his scales, just so that 
you know, it looks cool and uh, um, iridescent. And then getting the white, white, white of the sun and just trying to, again, trying. So bear with me, I'm losing a lot of the negative space between each scale. Trying to unify the light on the pyramid that's reflected back with the light on the character. In fact, I don't have enough time to dedicate it to iridescence, so I'm just going to desaturate that back down. A little bit of bounce light coming off the surface of the pyramid. These are colossal scales we're talking about, so this will get some bounce light on it. <coughs> um, and I think that's it. I think the design itself, the staging, it all seems a little bit boring. Um, mostly because your character is not placed properly. But if it was a simple um, colossal character staged in a magic card type of environment, um, I really have nothing to complain about. Might brighten this up just a bit more actually and saturate, brighten and saturate, there we go. And then the character, because the light is behind them, I might darken and desaturate. Um, I darken with a blue wash. Just because the character is so far up in the environment up there, I just want them to look like they they're so big, they are subject to some atmospheric fade. But it's also a magic card type situation, so... I might be able to just pull off some things that are up there. Okay, and then select inverse. And if the sun is coming from one part of the sky, you can have a gradient for the sun. Just remember the brush has to be massive for this, because the sun is a massive scale. Okay, so you see that now the environment is really coming together. You actually have a functional earth, a, 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 a hemisphere, a sky above, and um, some, some cool kind of gradient work for the desert behind. I would desaturate the inside of this pyramid a little bit more. And sometimes pyramids are so bright, they really do get like super white when they when the light is on them like it can be up to probably this level white something like that they, they do get pretty sparkly uh, that's again up to you if it's a stone pyramid if it's just dunes it's hard to tell what texture you're aiming for right now I'm gonna try to find a median if the character is behind the Sun a little cast shadow won't hurt. Cast shadow is always a nice amount of sex appeal <laughs> in painting. Um, Alright, so bullet points of today's class. What uh, What's going on? Um, if this scale here is relieved of some of the cast shadow, you might have a little belt of light just sitting right on top. where the light touches. See that? It's just slightly revealed right out of the light just up there. Okay? And uh, if they're so big, they just came out of the, 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 the ground, the characters are looking up, and, and Alex Konstad is the one who illustrated it, you might want to throw in some like really blurry foreground pyramid stuff that is dark and blurry. That might give you some range and depth. I'm just gonna fake it. Blur. Gage and blur. Oops. So yeah, I added that glare. I'll take care of that glare in a second. But filter, blur. Gaussian. 
just stuff in the foreground, you know, really gives it that depth. But again, only if you're Alex. <laughs> I really love his uh, magic cards. And then you've got that glare. So now it's become a full on illustration. We have some, you know, maybe a scorpion, a little tiny scorpion. This guy's just, you know, surveying over his land that he owns. Right? So we've got before, dark, dark, but what's explaining all the light? And after, a little bit more of an active environment. An active meaning things blur, things reflect, things jump around, colors are bright enough, everything reflects everything. Figure out, after identifying the light source, figure out what planes face the core light. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I really am looking for something important as the very first bullet point of today. Identify your light environment. There we go, cardboard box has it. Water reflects the light environment, although the water surface is very reflective. Where light hits, don't rely on contrast for your whole painting. Yeah, now he does look look huge. Um, then we have uh, figure out what the planes uh, face the core light and what the, what gets core shadows. Then take into account reflections and cast shadows. Don't be too concerned with making your character lighter than the environment. <coughs> This rack just seems to instantly know and see how things should be in an instant. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Afrin Fok al Ada Shana Afrin Fok al Ada E. Um because the dodge tool sat saturates, yes, dodge tool saturates it like messing with the gamma, yes, so um, always follow dodge tool with it with a desaturation, never just have raw dodge tool shit all over your painting, I'm so sorry, don't just have dodge tool feces like trailing your painting everywhere and oversaturating and giving it that really cheesy nasty look. Only some things need to this excessive saturation. And in an, in a same thing goes with any other particle effects. Particle effects, excessive particle effects are hand in hand with excessive dodge tool dependence. It's like you're throwing glitter on a piece of crap. It's still gonna be a piece of crap with some glitter on it. It doesn't it doesn't redeem it of being a piece of crap. It doesn't change it from being a piece of crap. So in a in a desert environment, the thing that works the most, in fact these should be cooler. What am I doing? In a desert environment, what works the most is your um, your glare, to the glare of the sun, looking up and seeing, you know, barely seeing the object. Like this much glare still worked. You can barely see the object, but he's still freaky as all hell. And he's a worm with arms. This guy did nothing gets away with him from him when he's decided that it's food. Uh, so this this alone is working. You've got all the functional parts working. The gesture is great. Um, you just had to throw in all the sand effect and all of this other stuff and you thought that that might work particle effects are cheesy they don't really do much for you and that super super glare i mean blur of sand rising up off the ground that he just surfaced from it shouldn't be that much sand i mean we would be off camera anyway and the biggest thing that took up most of the space of the painting is the sky. So we're looking up at him, which is why that foreground blur. I mean, you could change these stupid little dunes I added. You can add the character himself freaking out when seeing him. Um, you can add birds scattering away as they see him kind of surface. Uh, but that's what makes the desert environment happen, especially if most of your painting is sky, is that glare of the desert sun right on the camera. Don't put it in the painting. Never take a picture of the sun, never frame the sun in your painting if you can avoid it. But just, um, you know, that's that's what makes it work. The reflection, the light environment, the blue. <clears throat> How much do we saturate? Um, just enough that you got rid of that new amount of saturation. You should really know how much you're desaturating after dodge tool because your intention to use dodge tool was just to raise a value, right? You weren't expecting saturation delete how much saturation you weren't expecting is what you should be it's like a you're basing it off what you used it for um keep detail away from the edge of the canvas the character when there is one decides the mood of the piece conflicting messages make for hard reads excellent sky tower 
Okay, guys, that's it for today. I'll try to do more creepy creatures on Thursday. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Please don't forget that there is a Portrait Studio uh, sale currently active. So if you guys saw it in action today, if you feel like owning it, it'll help you really draft all kinds of scenes. It'll help you answer all the questions you have. You don't have to be any specific level to have Portrait Studio to use it. It'll help you in your education process. So it's an educational tool as much as a drafting tool. Um, uh, you can, there's all kinds of models in it. You guys have, you guys have seen the trailer videos for it. Um, thank you to everyone who's purchased it. Thank you guys for your support. If you guys are interested in more lessons like this and more homework, I do offer an apprenticeship, um, on, uh, Patreon. So if you guys want to head over there, isterback.com, click on the Patreon icon. It'll take you there. We're about next week about to do our environment pieces. So the critique hour, so the homework for this month was environment themed. Um, and learning how to fill up a scene with foliage and mountains and ca managing the camera and framing. Uh, so all of that is available for apprentices. Uh, uh, and the critique hour for that is on the 4th. Also all PSDs of my own personal work or anything like that. But on the 4th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time will be our meetup for apprentices. There's also other tiers that have educational material in them. Um, and uh, there might be an upcoming tier for private tutoring through Patreon. It'll be a four-person group, um, and you guys get homework. It's the same thing as private tutoring. You just share it with three other students or four other students. Um, so it's a much smaller group, much more geared towards portraiture, and um, not as, as large a group as the apprentice group. And that might be available January 2019. To buy Portrait Studio, you just go to isterback.com and click on the store icon. It's on sale now. It'll be on sale again December, the week of, of Christmas. And please, if I offered you a reward of any time in the past three months and I didn't get back to you, please find me on Facebook. The Facebook group icon is right here on isterback.com, little Facebook icon. And you can message me if you have not gotten your rewards for good note takers and stuff. I do look through the notes note taker category here. So class notes, I look through it. Whoever has done a good job, especially from today's class, I reward them brush sets and really, really good um, students get Portrait Studio. Um, so um, that's always available for you guys if you can't. If you still see the price of these brushes and Portrait Studio is a little steep, you always have another way of getting it. And to upload your work for now until Google collapses for some reason, um, you can click on the little Google Plus icon to join and submit your work. Um, and yes, please do get started as soon as possible on your elf designs and get started on your Hall um, Christmas town environment uh, paintings so we can have a nice fun get together. Maybe even on Christmas, I might do a critique hour or right before Christmas holidays. I take it on the 20th. Um, so the 18th will be the due date. So you guys have one, two, three weeks, maybe, maybe um, a couple extra days more than three weeks. One, two, three, yeah. Um, to do the environment studies um, and, and the elf design. So I'll see you guys on Thursday the 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye guys.